All right, everybody got your paper tonight. If you have a handout from two weeks ago, we will say, we'll call it last week's handout, the last time we met. But we're going to need to start in the gift of the word of wisdom. But I want to I want to just give you just a quick word of encouragement. Last couple of weeks, I've, the Lord's been talking to me a little bit about asking Him for the double portion. And I've been looking at, at Lord, what would that double portion look like? Because a lot of people want the double portion, but they don't know what a double portion of what. I, I, I've, and I've been like, Lord, I want a double portion of the Holy Spirit. I want a double portion of His anointing. I, I want a double portion of, of what you would normally have for me. I just ask you to just double it, Lord. Just double it. And, and the Lord began to put this in my heart. Operate in the gifts, because it's the equivalent of a double portion. Isn't that good? So it's like He's given us everything we need. And so we want more power, but we have to operate in the power we have first. Amen? So let's operate in that power. And uh, the Lord just was just very kind, but just was like, you know what? The double portion of the New Testament, there's, there's, there's endless amounts of God in our lives. But a, a double portion could be looked at as what Elisha got from Elijah. When the mantle fell, he had to be in the right place to get it. You're in the right place tonight to get it. Amen. The mantle's falling on you. Amen? Because you chose to be in the right place to learn. And Elijah, Elisha had to be in the right place to follow Elijah all over the place. Remember how Elijah tried to ditch Elisha three times. He tried to ditch him three times and see if he'd, how stern he'd be about following him. But Elisha said, I ain't letting you out of my sight. I won't even so much as blink because I don't want you to move. And Elijah would say, oh, it's okay. You just stay here. I'm going to go up over here and do some stuff. He's like, no, mm -mm, no. And that's how we have to become about how, if we want God to move supernaturally in our lives. Okay? I, I don't want to, I'm not talking about being a spooky Christian. I'm talking about being a spirit-filled, both feet on the ground, know who you are in Christ Jesus, knowing the word, and still saying, you know what? I'm going to operate supernaturally by God's Spirit when I need to. Amen? So with that said, let's take, we, we went through the word, the gift of the word of wisdom, and we ended in, in the middle of the gift of the word of knowledge. So you'll be on page eight of that handout that you have. And let's just review quickly. I'm not going to go through everything on page eight. But in the gift of the word of wisdom, man's definition of knowledge would be familiarity gained by actual experience, practical skill, acquaintance with facts, having information of facts. But biblical definition of the gift of the word of knowledge extends from a supernatural. So your blank there is supernatural revelation by the Holy Spirit of certain facts in the mind of God. Everybody say facts. So it's facts in the mind of God of things that happened um, in the past. So a gift of a word of knowledge is something that happened in the past. So if he opens up your, your mind to something and it's a gift of a word of wisdom, it's going to be something that happened in the past or may be currently happening up to the present. So keep that in mind. It's kind of a, a very defined area. But it's, it's the gift of the word of knowledge is not naturally gained. Knowledge through the course of life's experience or in humans or in man's educational systems. So in other words, you get that by getting a plaque on the wall. It's called a degree. But what we're talking about is something that you only get, like with Paul, he went out to the desert of Paran, and there he learned from the Holy Spirit for three and a half years. Amen? There he learned by the Holy Spirit. So the, this gift is not the complete and total knowledge of God, but knowledge obtained through reading, hearing the Word, uh, the Word of God. The believer comes to a deeper knowledge of and who Jesus Christ, and, and with Jesus Christ, and, and becomes comfortable in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Listen, if you're uncomfortable in the presence of the Holy Spirit or in the presence of God, then you need to become more familiar with your Bible. So here's where we start, uh, where we left off a couple weeks ago. Now, through praying the Word, God opens up our understanding of a word of knowledge as defined. Did you guys get that last time we, were, we met? Is, did that one? You got that one? So then we probably don't need to read Acts 9, but um, I think we start right here at the note, I think. Is that where we start? Okay. The word of wisdom versus the word of knowledge. So we know what the word of knowledge and the word of wisdom is, and that, that the revelation that the word of knowledge usually brings is present tense or concerning something that happened in the past. 
So we just talked about that, along with facts of the situation. So that's what a word of knowledge would be. Now, if you look in, old, in the Old Testament, in the book of 2 Kings, let's turn there. 2 Kings. I've been spending a lot of time in First and 2 Kings lately because that's where you find much information about the double portion that Elisha wanted from Elijah. And if you remember, he had to be in the place where he saw Elijah go up and ascend in a chariot of fire. And Elijah said, if you see me ascend, my mantle will fall on you. So he had to be in that position to receive that double portion of Elijah's ability, the double portion of the Holy Spirit, of God's Spirit upon his life. And if you remember then, he immediately, when Elijah went up in a chariot of fire, he picked up the mantle uh, uh, like, like a cloth over his shoulders, and he picked up the, a, a rod or a staff, and he smote the Jordan River because they had just smote it and went to one side. He smotes it again, splits it open the same way, and walks back across to the children of Israel. And there, if you remember, he, uh, he did a couple of miracles, and then some young people came out that were like Philistines or Canaanites, and they mocked him because he was bald. Anybody know what happened? He called out a she-bear from the woods, and she came out, and, and he cursed them, and she ate them. So don't mess with the pastor, okay? <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. So, Let's take a look at this. Naaman the Syrian has come to uh, Israel because he has leprosy. And he comes to Elijah, and long story short, he has leprosy and he wants to be healed of it. His slave girl, which was a Hebrew girl, said, hey, my guy can heal you. And so, sure enough, uh, Elijah, after he's prodded a couple times, didn't really want to heal Naaman the Syrian, didn't want to be, you know, didn't want to be troubled. But he says, go dip seven times in the Jordan River, and he did. On the seventh time, he was healed. His, his flesh was completely healed of leprosy. And um, so uh, here we see Gehazi, the servant, uh, sees that Naaman the Syrian wanted to pay Elijah. And Elijah said, no, no pay is necessary. But Gehazi is an evil servant. So he chased, after, after Naaman the Syrian leaves, Gehazi chases him out or chases after him out into the desert and he says, hey, you know what? We will take a little bit of that blessing. Go ahead and, and give it to me. And so we pick up the story here in verse 21. So Gehazi pr pursued Naaman. Uh, and when Naaman saw him running after him, he got down from his chariot to meet him and said, is everything well? And he said, all is well, my master has sent me, saying, indeed. Now, that was a lie, wasn't it? Because he, Naaman never sent him. So he says, my master has sent me saying, Indeed, just now two young men of the sons of prophets have come to me from the mountains of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two changes of garments. So Naaman said, Please take two talents. And he urged him and bound two talents of silver and two bags and two changes of garments and handed them to his servants, and they carried them on ahead of him. And when he came to the citadel, he took them from their hand and stored them away in the house. Then, in other words, he hid them. Then he let the men go, and they departed. Now he went in and stood before his master, Elisha, and Elisha said to him, Where did you go, Gehazi? And he said, Your servant did not go anywhere. That was a lie again, right? Then he said to him, Did not my heart go with you when the man turned back with his chariot to meet you? So there's a gift of a word of what? Knowledge, right? Because he's learning of something from the past, the recent past, and also something happening in the present. So here we see, uh, did, I, did my heart not go with you as he turned back from his chariot to meet you? Is it time to receive money, to receive clothing, olive groves and vineyards, sheep and oxen, male and female servants? So Elisha was not happy about that, was he? So now we see, therefore, the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and your descendants forever. And he went out from his presence, leprous as white as snow. So that was a, a gift of a word of knowledge, but also possibly a portion of a kind of a working of miracle, but how many of you know that, that the Old Testament, God is kind of like, he's just like straight cut. He's not going to pull any punches on things. He's, he's the God of the New Testament, aren't you thankful that Jesus is the mediator between us and God? Because he's a powerful God. He's a powerful God. So I'm glad for that. Now, I'll let you read Acts chapter 5 because it's kind of similar. Uh, Peter operates under the unction of the Holy Spirit when they're, they're, they're gathering uh, 
income for the church to get started. Ananias and Sapphira basically donate a piece of land. They're going to sell it and donate it to the church. And uh, they're getting the church kind of fired up financially. And Ananias said, we sold it for so much, and they sold it for twice that much. He brought in half. Now, he didn't have to tell him, we'd just give you uh, all the money. He could have designated whatever he wanted to designate, but he lied. And so it goes on, and it says, all the people of the town saw what happened to Ananias, which was he dropped dead in the presence of the Lord. And then his wife, Sapphira, came in, and, and Peter said, did you sell the land for this much, and are you going to give this much? And he said, she said, yes. And he says, well, the very feet of the people that buried your husband are here to bury you. That's a gift of a word of knowledge, because it's about something that happened in the past and going on in the present. Are you following me? So that's a gift of a word of knowledge. Now, this doesn't have to be just things that operate during a service in a church. It can operate any time in your life that you ask the Holy Spirit to help you. You can be a a candidate by reading the Word, having a lot of knowledge about how the Holy Spirit operates and works, and have that understanding in your heart, and He'll reveal things to you. Every, not a Sunday goes by. Every Sunday when I'm preaching, the Lord will begin to show me something that maybe I, I need to know about somebody for prayer, or that I need to preach about or talk about, and, and the Lord will just begin to show that to me. And we'll talk about it a little bit more as we talk about discerning of spirits. But let's, let's finish this first. Interesting fact about the two first gifts is that God is all-knowing and has all wisdom, uh, part of His omniscience. And in these gifts, He does not necessarily reveal everything. Both the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge reveal a word or a fragmentary part of what God wants the believer to know. And let me tell you something. If you think, well, I, I, it's not going to be very much, but I will tell you, it's always enough. It's enough for you to know what you're supposed to do or what, is, what you need to know. So, he does not impart all of his wisdom or knowledge on any gift, for that matter, at all at once, but rather he just what he wants us to know at that moment in time. Brother Hagen used to preach on this a lot, and we used to listen to a lot of his messages on, on this, the gifts of, of the Spirit, because I thought, I've always thought he was one of the best teachers. Uh, he's dead now, obviously, been with the Lord for many years, but uh, we still listen to a lot of his stuff on the gifts of the Spirit. So both gifts apply to people, places, and things. People, places, and things. Now, I want to give you a little bit of a, a side story. I'll go as fast as I can. Uh, you know, when Julie and I first moved here, um, we started Wednesday night services right away. We, we didn't have a launch. We didn't have all, all kinds of gathering up. We didn't repair and remodel the whole sanctuary, and we didn't have anything to do with all that. We didn't know to do that. We just started church. We started having church right there in the old building with the old ugly Harvest gold carpet and pews that would ladies would cut your legs if you were bare, bare legged. So they, they were just really a pleasant place to come to, th that church. And um, boy, howdy, were those holy cows. People did not want to have us touch them or anything like that. But on one particular Wednesday night, a young lady came into the church with her parents. They had rescued her from Hare Krishna. Um, organization in Washington. Does anybody know what Harry Krishna is about? It's, it's, it's a very sexual, de devious uh, um, use of a cult and very abusive to the, to the clients that follow them, the people that follow them. And they, they abduct them and take them in away from their family, with their family. They, they basically kidnap them so their family does not know where they're at and they don't let them have any, um, any contact with the outside world. And so this man and his wife had found where she was at. They have, somehow they knew, and they drove to Washington, and they abducted her and brought her home. And that night, brought her into the service. And Julie and I were just young pastors. Oh, my goodness. I look back at that, and I think, boy, were we green behind the ears. I'm telling you what. So we, we uh, prayed for her and prayed for her and prayed for her and prayed for her and cast that demon out, and she'd be fine. She'd be like, come she come come around. She had a demon of sexual abuse, a demon of physical abuse, and, and it would rise up and it would speak to us and it would talk. And you talk about putting goosebumps on your arms. You know, I, I never really knew or wanted to talk with a demon. I didn't have a you know a, a fetish with that. I didn't want to. I didn't even know to stay away from it. But I didn't also know what to do with it. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? And so this thing just kept rising up and talking to us in a different voice, and, and she would speak out about certain things. And she had been sexually used as prostitute, sexually abused in many ways, shapes and forms, and so there were just like three or four different demons in her that would talk to us and come back out, and, and, I'd, and I'd call them out, and I'd say, now you be gone in Jesus' name, and I rebuke you. And finally, 
I listened because it would come back right back on her and it would just continue to operate, wouldn't it, honey? It would just continue to operate. So finally, I just said, wait a second, we're not, we're not doing something right here. And I just, I just kind of stood by. I remember putting my hand on a pulpit that my grandfather had actually preached from when he was the pastor of that church. And I put my hand on it like this and I stood there and the Holy Spirit said to me, this one only comes out by prayer and fasting. Fast three days, go to her house and cast it out. And so we called the whole church. There was probably 15 or 20 of us by that time, maybe. Um, we're just a very small little church. And um, I just told them, hey, we're not going to pray anymore. We're just going to put her in the car and take her home. And um, th- this demon wouldn't let her shower, take a bath, get cleaned up. So she was a stinky mess, you might guess. And um, so I said, let's pray and fast for three days. So we did. We fasted and prayed. Julie and, went over there. Julie and I went over there on the third day. The minute we opened the door, this thing starts growling at us, this demon, and it kept saying, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill your family. I'll bring destruction on you. And, and it would just literally hurl all kinds of abuse and bring things up about us somehow that it maybe kind of knew or something. And, and so it would just keep hurling these things at us. And, and it just gives me a, a sick stomach even talking about it. But I'll just say this quickly. Uh, she had her head buried in a, a sofa. She said, I know you're coming. And, and, I, and so I just, I just touched her, and she was like, don't touch me. And, and uh, I'm not coming out. And she just had her head buried in the sofa, bent over like you would pray, like a preacher position, and, and then um, had her head buried in the sofa. She still hadn't had a shower for those three days or cleaned up at all. And so I just said, well, there's demons that are in her. You know that we prayed and fasted. And I want you to know that the blood of Jesus is against you. Because now, see, I knew who I was, and he, it knew who I was. And that I had come to throw it out, that I had now authority where I didn't have authority before. Now I have authority. It's like, now I got my legs under me. Now I got my fighting hands, and now I'm ready to go because I'm, I'm equipped. And I laid hands on her, Julie and I, and the parents, we laid hands on her, and we cast that thing out. And within 30 seconds, she stood up and she said, oh. And she looked around the room, she goes, it's gone. And so we prayed for her that it would not come back. It would not come back seven times stronger, but that she would be freed from it. And she looked at me and she just goes, do you mind if I go get a shower? (laughs) I said, no, by all means. (laughs) She went and got a shower, came out. She hasn't had had any demonic, cultic issues since that time. And, And from time to time, we go through Walmart and she works there. Hallelujah. Amen. And uh, I'm not going to tell her you her name, but she works at Walmart. I'll put it that way. And she's a sweet, sweet girl. Comes up to us anytime she, we, we're there. She'll walk up to us and give us a hug and tell, her, tell us how much she loves us. Amen. She now goes to, uh, I think, probably a church out in Eaton with her parents, right? They, they used to be associate pastors here, and then they went to help their cousin start a church in uh, Eaton, Eaton, Colorado. And it's a Hispanic church, so... Um, it's a good thing. Amen? So with that said, the example of both gifts working together, we, we saw that I had to see into what the demon was doing and where it came from, and I knew what was going on before I put the words Hare Krishna together. And then her dad said, yeah, that's right. It's, she, we, we abducted her, rescued her from a, from a Hare Krishna uh, ward center in Washington. And so then... Jesus said, this only comes out by prayer and fasting, like I told you. So that was something of the present that I needed to know. From the past, moving up into the present. And let me tell you something. You get your flying wings when you go through something like that. Amen? You get your wings. And, um, and then in the future, you know, I was told, have the church pray. And then go cast that thing out. Fast and pray. So um, with that said, I'm going to move swiftly past that. Because um, while I like, I'm okay telling the testimony, I don't want to give air to the, to the devil or demonic beings, and I don't want them to feel like they're, they've got a, a, a way into your heart. Amen? So I, I just want to just pray over us before I go on, okay? So Heavenly Father, I just pray in the name of Jesus that if there's anyone who's ever had an open heart to a demon, that in the name of Jesus, that door is boarded up, it's locked, the window has been covered, there is no way into that person's heart. And in Jesus' name, I just cast out any area that someone might be dealing with demonic things. So, Father, may they not even toil with it, give airtime to it. And in Jesus' name, we turn to you, Jesus, who is the highest authority. 
and we worship you. We thank you for tonight. Holy Spirit, come and fill us now as we learn about discerning of spirits. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Everybody say, ha ha devil. <laughs> Amen. Just say that to him anytime you can. So the biblical definition of discern is it means to see with the eye of the mind or the spiritual eye of the believer, insightfully detecting, separating, distinguishing, and discriminating certain situations, distinctions, and even similarities that the Holy Spirit wants the believer to focus on. So in other words, if, if you operate and are allowed to operate with the discerning of spirits, notice it's plural, um, in this case where you, it's multiple different kinds of spirits, it, it will kind, the Holy Spirit will help you have a, develop a spiritual eye. It, it will literally be like if you know someone is cooking um, a hamburger in a house, you know the difference between a hamburger and Chinese food. Amen? You'll walk in and go, hmm, smells like Chinese food. Or you'll walk in and go, hey, we having hamburgers tonight? Or you'll walk in and say, oh, pork chops, smells really good. You know the difference in the smell with your nose, right? It's a different smell. So likewise, will there be an opening, so to speak, of your senses to a demonic spirit, sometimes a good spirit. You might recognize that there's a good spirit, a good moral, good character behind somebody. That's okay, too. That's, that's part of discerning of spirits. And so all those areas of character and uh, attributes of distinctions, even similarities, there's insightful detecting that you'll see. Let's get started on it. The gift of this of discerning of spirits gives the spirit-filled believer supernatural insight. So you might know something about somebody from their past, but you have to discount that because now you're looking into the spiritual realm if God calls you to. Okay? Now, um, it's supernatural insight into the entire realm of spirits to see activity by de demonic spirits and what type of spirit is working behind the scenes of something and even when the Holy Spirit is working. So you'll be able to see when the Holy Spirit's touching someone's life and their heart begins to break. For instance, sometimes in the, in the physical realm, someone in the service will come in on a Sunday morning and it happened in the 9.30 service this past Sunday. I don't think they're here, but if they are, they'll know what I'm talking about. At the, during, at the onset of the service, when I turned around to preach, this person did not want to be here. They had been forced to be here or told to be here or something. They did not want to be here. And by the time the end of the service was there, they were like this. He's making gestures, just, and then staring off into space, and then pretty soon, like before the service was over, they were leaning forward, leaning into the Holy Spirit, leaning into the teaching and listening. And by the end of the service, head down, hand up. Wanted to receive and rededicate to Jesus. Why? I discerned that spirit of an antichrist that had told them who they weren't and they thought they could never get past it. It's what he told me. He said, I, I, I've been in services before and I'm never, nothing ever works, he said. Nothing ever changes. And by the end of the service, the Holy Spirit had convinced him that Jesus loves him. Amen? Amen. That's why we do what we do. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. So discerning of spirits is um, discerned the, the gift. This gift discerns into the spiritual realm as defined above. It is limited to the realm or class of spirits. However, it's the full class or spectrum of spirits, including bad spirits, good spirits, and even human spirits. Human spirit. He, sometimes God will open up the eyes of your understanding to someone who. Has, has maybe accepted Christ as their Savior, but they haven't released everything to Him. That's when you can, the Holy Spirit will help you look into their heart, look into their life. And then as a pastor, maybe as I'm preaching the Holy Spirit, I'm giving away my secrets here, but I'm going to tell you what I do, okay? And that's because it's his, it's his deal, not mine. But sometimes He'll show me that someone in the service, like I don't look to 
to try and preach at people, but the Holy Spirit just wants me to say certain things that I don't even know is touching that person's heart. And it'll be like, I have to say something, and I'll say it, and you've never released this, and so you need to turn it over to God today. It's time to turn it over today. And then that person will come up to me and say, you were talking to me. Or I'll say something in the message, and they'll come up to me, and they'll say, man, you were sitting on my lap with your finger in my chest. You talked to me the whole time. Did you talk to my wife, by the way? Or did, you, did my kids come and tell you everything about me? And I'm just like, that is called a discerning of a spirit that God wanted to throw off by the preaching of the word. Okay, so let's move on. Sometimes to know what something is, it helps to know what it is not. So the gift of discerning of spirits is not mind or palm reading, mind or palm reading, nor is it the power to discern the mere faults of others. In other words, God would never just give you something to say, this is all your faults, this is how bad of a person you are, okay? He would never do that to call somebody down. But it may be used sometime to say, you've dealt with this, haven't you? You've dealt with alcoholism, haven't you? Now, that's a fault, but you're not calling them down for it. You're merely calling it out and saying, God wants to help you with that alcoholism. God wants to help you with that pornography. God wants to help you with that lust. God wants to help you with, you know, spending all your money on, on certain things. God wants to help you get your finances in control. Those are the types of things that a, a discerning of spirit because there's all kinds of, there's financial spirits out there that sound like it's a great investment to make, but they're luring you into a place where you'll lose your money so that then you're de dependent on someone else or something else, amen? That there's a spirit that is, is regionally over, excuse me, nationally over America that I truly believe that's about the, the, the finances of people to get us onto, connected onto, dependent upon the government, Amen? Are you following me? Do you, do you see, could you see a spirit like that hovering over this nation to get us into credit card debt, to get us into all kinds of debt over our head? There's good debt and there's bad debt. Amen? Okay. The good debt is the kind you can pay for. The bad debt is when you can't. Okay. It's pretty simple, isn't it? So um, it's not mind reading or palm reading. Nor is it the power to discern mere faults of others. It just it might be understood that discerning of spirits is not limited to discerning evil spirits. So just understand that. But regional, national spirits over a region or even over a nation. Discerning a spirit is not to be confused with discerning a work of the flesh. You can fill that blank in. A work of the flesh. As per Galatians chapter 5. Let's turn there quickly. Galatians chapter 5. Man, where does the night go, huh? Hallelujah. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 19 through 21. Look what it says. It says, now the works of the flesh are what? What are they? Come on, wake up. Come on. Well, the works of the flesh are what? What are they? All right, they're evident. You know. You know what the works of the flesh are. Let's read what they are. It says, now the works of the flesh are evident. So adultery, that's a work of the flesh. Okay? The flesh is, has a work of fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But... The fruit of the Spirit is other things. It's the, there's, there's a fruit of the Spirit called love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. So the, 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 the flesh has evident, evident kind of things. And, and th those things uh, are works. Now, can a spirit be behind them? Absolutely. But I believe that the person who wants to have a, an adulterous affair or fornication or uncleanness, lewdness, I, all of those, sorcery, hatred, contentions, they first will think about it, and there is no demonic activity. It's an evident work of the flesh. So don't think, well, I, I do adultery or I do you know, hatred or I do stealing or thievery. Or that, that's just a demonic thing in my, in my life. No, 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 no. That goes back to the flesh. Everybody say the flesh. So what does that mean? You can control it. We can control it. It's called discipline. Amen? Self-discipline. That's why 
You remember, Jesus said, don't even look upon a woman with lust in your heart, for it's the same thing as having committed adultery with her. That means we've got to, men, we've got to watch where our eyes go. Amen? Ladies, you've got to make sure our eyes don't go there, so don't so keep it covered. Amen? Hallelujah. Come on. Come on. Amen? Make it easy on us. All right. So the works of the flesh are evident, cannot be mistaken. However, the Holy Spirit will use the discerning of spirits to reveal the believer to the believer the type of demonic spirit involved behind the works or involved in a situation. So maybe a struggle with the flesh. Maybe there's someone that you discern is, man, they're having a struggle with the flesh and a demonic being is ready to take over and encourage it. Now, now let me paint the picture for you. Someone is, is thinking about, you know, uh, an act of hatred. And instead of stopping it by going to the Word of God, which they can do because the, the works of the flesh are evident. Amen? It's a work of the flesh, the carnal flesh. They can control it. How? Two words. Stop it. <laughs> right? Stop it. Go to the, what do I mean by that? Much more deeper. AKA, go to the Word. Start replacing what those thoughts would be with the Word of God. Interrupt the thought. Say that with me. Ready? Interrupt the thought. You might have looked upon a beautiful woman. All of a sudden you go from, wow, that's, that's a beautiful woman, to uh, I'd like to have sex with her. And it all happens in the glance of a moment. Ladies, men, it happens. And so you have to go, you have to continue to then interrupt the thought. Right? If I have you begin to count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and in the middle of it I say, now think of a black Labrador. You would have to quit thinking of the number and counting in order to, in your mind, see a black Labrador dog, right? It's the same thing with the Spirit of God. If you're thinking an evil thought, you're going down a wrong road where something is causing you to sin, and you don't want, it, you don't want demonic activity because, remember, James chapter 1, verse 14 What's it say? It says, if sin is left alone, right, it will take you to a place of what? Full-blown sin, separation from God. So what do we want to do? On the road to the sin, we want to stop. We want to interrupt it by doing what? Put the Word of God in. And then you'll never have to discern that spirit in your own life. Why? Because you interrupt the thought every time it tries to take you there. I really hope the devil says about Rick Carlson, hey, I don't want to play with that guy no more. He's no fun. He won't go with us no more anymore. He don't run with us no more. Amen? Amen? That's what I want. Okay. Let's wrap this portion up. Um, this good teaching tonight? Yeah. Amen? So next week when you get here at 5 till, we'll start pre-service prayer. Amen? So come early and then get your talking done. And at about five minutes... Four minutes, three minutes, we'll start, we'll start pre-service prayer. Because don't you, didn't you feel a double portion of the anointing during worship tonight? Did you feel a difference there? That's because we were pressing into God. All right, we got to hurry up here. Um, the example of this gift in operation is Acts chapter 16. Um, let's turn there really quickly. Acts chapter 16. Are you still here tonight? Okay. Acts chapter 16 and verse 16. A certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshipped God. The Lord opened her heart to, he to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, If you would judge me faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So they stayed for a while. Now in verse 16, it happened as he went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us, who brought her masters much profit by fortune-telling. So a spirit of divination is a demonic spirit that could also be a similar spirit to tell the future. Okay? So the Holy Spirit will tell you the future, but listen, the devil can mimic that. He can be, that's why he's called the Antichrist, because he's a type of Christ, but he's anti. He's not, he's not the Christ. He's a counterfeit. Amen? So let's move on. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High who proclaim to us the way of salvation. 
And this she did for many days, but Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and, and he came out of her that very hour. So he was greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit of divination. He recognized it as a spirit that could tell the, uh, the fortune or the future. And then he cast it out, and he said, in the name of Jesus. Let me tell you something. Every demonic being will turn an ear towards you with the name of Jesus. But you got to have the authority. That's why I had to go away for three days and pray and fast, and then go cast that demon out of that girl. And I had to have a church praying with me, standing behind me and Julie as we cast that thing out. But when her masters saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas, dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities, and they brought them to the magistrate and said, these men being Jews, exceedingly trouble the city. And it goes on. And so they, they get thrown in jail and get freed because of, of their singing hymns and what have you. All, all kinds, you can read on the story there. But they recognize the spirit of divination in this young girl. It spoke through the girl and mockingly revealed the messages they were speaking and Paul wasn't having it. In fact, he got a belly full of it and finally just turned it and said, in the name of Jesus, come out of her now. And, and I, I just sometimes I just sometimes you, you feel that in maybe as your pastor, you, you, you feel it in me when I just kind of you know, I'm preaching all of a sudden I just get really bold. and It's like you got to you guys got to get through this. You got to gather this. And sometimes it's just a spirit of boldness. Amen. And so discern that <laughs> discern that and say, "Ooh, I better pay attention to that because God's operating in our church, in us. Now, I want you to turn to 1 John before we close tonight. In 1 John chapter 4, I'm going as quickly as I can because we didn't get as far as we should have tonight. <sighs> Go figure that, huh? 1 John chapter 4, here's the litmus test of how you should be operating to know if a, an evil spirit is behind something. Beloved, verse 1, 1 John ch chapter 4, verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit. Wouldn't that be good? Hello? Yeah. Beloved, do not believe every spirit. Say that with me. Ready? Beloved, do not believe every spirit. Say it again. Beloved, do not believe every spirit. Even if it seems right, looks right, smells right, just wait a second. Okay? Be patient. Because look what he says. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. So here's, here's the litmus test. You'll know if it's the Spirit of God or not, because every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. So if I'm, if I'm having to deal with something, the first thing I'll say to somebody is, let's get it clear. Do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yeah, I do. Or, no, I, I never really have received him. Now, that doesn't mean they have an evil spirit. That just tells me where, where to begin. Amen? So I'm still going to discern what's going on in the spirit of a human. Not an evil, necessarily evil, just discerning where they're at. And it's okay to ask a question. Do you, have you accepted and confessed? Do you openly confess that Jesus is your Lord? That's an important thing. Now, and at verse 3, And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. So therefore, if, you, if you're praying for someone and you just sense because of this teaching, because of the teaching of the gifts of the Spirit, you just sense that, there's something wrong here. They're not receiving. What is it that's stopping it? Go ahead and just say, you know, have, have you accepted Jesus as Lord? Do you confess that he came in the flesh, died on the cross, and rose victoriously from hell and, and ascended to the right hand of the Father? Do you believe that? And if they say, yes, I've accepted him as my Lord and Savior, then you go, okay, well, then let's proclaim him right now. See, don't, don't delay. Just say, let's, let's just proclaim him right now. Let's just openly proclaim Jesus. And if they won't, then they haven't really told you the whole truth, okay? And so you just discern some of those things, and you'll learn how to, how to maneuver, how to navigate through those rocks in that time of prayer. Um, and then reading on, it says, And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. Hey, don't think the Antichrist is coming, is, is somewhere else coming. He's here, Okay? I think he's probably operating right now as the Antichrist will come down from the north. He, he could come down from Russia. He could come down from Gog, Magog. He's coming down from the north, and he's going to come down towards the south into Israel. And I believe he is here in the flesh today in operating inside of a, a human being. He has to be. 
because we're in the end times. I believe he's on the earth and he's alive today. But there's a spirit of the Antichrist that's always been on the face of the earth. I believe the true one and only Antichrist is operating and starting to begin to put together his army and his coalition. I, I truly believe that's happening right now. I'm not a naysayer. I'm not a the sky is falling kind of guy. I'm ready to go forward. I can rebuke the enemy. I know who I am in Christ. But we better know the Antichrist is in the world today. He's here. Amen? So you are of God, little children, and have overcome them. What? Who, who are them? These, these spirits that won't confess Jesus as their Lord. If someone won't confess him, there, there's a good chance that a demonic activity is going on there, a spiritual activity. So if you say, I, I don't know, Pastor, I think I have a demon. Are you confessing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Keep confessing it, and every time something comes up about it, go to the Word of God. Tell Him who you are in Christ, and tell Him who He is under your feet in the name of Jesus. All right, let's close up now and look what it says. Because He who is in you is greater than He who is in the world. Folks, we're dealing with something that the devil cannot handle, and that's the Holy Spirit. We're dealing with something here, a someone who can be grieved and be hurt, and yet at the same time, he'll operate and he'll tell you things to come. And he'll tell you sometimes, we'll get over there in a couple weeks. He'll tell you sometimes in tongues. That's why it's important not to come against the gifts of the Spirit, because you grieve the Holy Spirit. And if you haven't been taught on tongues, or you've been taught against tongues, then keep coming, because we're going to teach you what the Word says. Okay? Not what wives' fables are, not what human religion is about, not what man-made doctrine says, but what the Word of God says. We'll open it up and we'll teach that. Amen? Okay. Any questions tonight? I think I have two more lines to fill in. So you can see there that the Spirit of God uses this gift to reveal His very own presence, dealings, and when He is in operation in Acts chapter 8, verse 18, you can look at that as well. But you'll also be glad to know that the inward witness can be our guide. So if you say, Pastor, I've never been used in a gift of a spirit. Let me tell you something. It, that's okay. The inward witness is, is something that I just say is just kind of a mm-hmm or a mm-mm. Amen? Kind of like a red uh, a stoplight. It's either red. Brother Hagin used to say it like this. He used to say just act like it's a stoplight in your, in, your, in your vision, so to speak. There's a red light that says, mm, don't go any further. Just, this is just the inward witness. This is not a gift of the Spirit. This is just, you can operate by the, an inward witness, and you just have a red light that says, man, I, I'm not supposed to go further in that thought. I'm not supposed to go further in this relationship. I'm not supposed to go further in, in this financial investment. I'm not supposed to go further in something like this. It, it's a red light. And then there's those times when you have... Man, I'm supposed to go. Let's go. Let's, let's move along. Come on, church. As, as sometimes as a pastor, I'm like, come on, let's go. Let's get going. You're supposed to move along a little bit faster. Come on, let's, let's make sure that you'll hear me say sometimes if I say, hey, let's come up for prayer. Come on, pick it up. Pick up your stuff and let's come up front really quick. Because not because of so much time, because the Holy Spirit's moving. And I want you to press into the things of God. Amen? And then there's that time when you'll get a yellow light. And remember, a yellow light only stays on for a certain time. Right? If it's in the red light, if it's in the green light, it's going to go yellow and then red. And so if you are going along and all of a sudden you feel in your spirit, okay, I'm supposed to proceed, but with caution. I'm, I, I can keep moving here, but I'm, I'm waiting for the, the energized red light to come on, and then I'm, I'm going to wait. Oh, come on, Rick, let's go, man. This, this is a great time to do all these things and everything. No, I'm, that, that's good for your town. I've been to conferences where the People want you to do all kinds of things and take it back to your church and do that same thing there. And I've learned that don't work in Wellington. Amen? I have to pray for, to, for God to tell me what re, what's good for Wellington, what's good for River of Life, what's good for you, what's good for people under my shepherding capabilities, what is good for them. And so I'll, I, I don't really go to too many of those things anymore other than to learn how to be a better pastor, how to be a better shepherd, not how to bring things back here. Amen? So um, then, you know, sometimes you might just get a, 
a, a flashing yellow, yield, 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 and it just stays on, a flashing yellow. That means you just, you better, better be careful. You want to get over into the area where you're in the will of God where you get a green light and not a flashing yellow. Amen? You'll know in your spirit. You'll just be kind of like, hmm, wow, something about that doesn't feel right. Or you might be hearing a teaching where you might say, man, it may not be so much that it's wrong, but it's not for you. Or it might be for somebody else in the room that I might be saying something, but you might say, okay, I can't pick up on that because that's not for me. It doesn't fit me right now. The pastor's not wrong in it. Or the speaker, whoever it is, he's not wrong. She's not wrong. But it must be for somebody else. So I don't try to, I'm not going to try and pick up on that because I might pick up a wrong word. Are you following me? Okay. Brother Hagen always used, also used to say, it'll be kind of like a velvety feeling in your spirit if you should go forward. Just kind of a, a good velvet feel, kind of that, mmm. You want to snuggle into that couch and, mm, oh, feels good. Versus uh, putting a sandpaper co coat on or something, you know, it's like, ah, ugh, this feels bad. So you'll, you'll know in your spirit when you feel that way. Amen? Did that help you tonight? Okay. And everybody can operate in it. That's the inward witness. You get that when you get saved. Amen? The gifts of the spirit, yeah, they're going to be some of the things that we more defined, like what we talked about. All right, let's stand. Let's close with a word of prayer. Let's pray for each other. We got time tonight. 8.05, we got about 10 minutes. Let me ask you a question for maybe next week. Which gift do you think is the best gift? What do you think? Which gift is the best gift? I'll tell you. I'll give you the clue, an answer. It's the gift that's needed the most at the time. Amen? Amen? If you need healing, discerning of spirits doesn't do you really any good. Are you, are you following me? If you need to discern a spirit, a gift of faith doesn't really, I mean, faith is good, don't get me wrong, but, but a gift of, of faith doesn't really help you. If you need a healing, you need a gift of healings. Amen? If, you, if you're dealing with some demonic being, then you need to, not a gift of healing, you need a, a gift of discerning of spirits. So that's why then, if you're going to go into a situation where you know you're going to be praying for somebody or some situation, ask the Lord, Lord, if you can use the inward witness in my life to discern that and to operate by that, kind of with that red light, green light, go, no, go, mm-hmm, feels right, uh-uh, no, mm, I better back up and just hold on. I'm not going further anymore. Then, then Lord, just use the inward witness. But, it, but if I need a gift of the Spirit, Lord, I don't operate it. You, you've got to help me with that. That's operated by the will of your Spirit, not by mine. And so, Lord, I'll just rely on you. You, you give me what I need. And if, and if you can be used by the inward witness, he'll use that. But if you need a gift of the Spirit, be open to it. W would you be open to it? I want to tell you something that the Holy Spirit kind of revealed to me through the putting together of this training today and that's this that the reason that we don't see like working of miracles a lot anymore and a lot of the gifts of the spirit operating in the church anymore is because we don't earnestly desire those gifts first corinthians chapter 12 verse 31 says earnestly desire the gifts of the spirit earnestly desire these gifts the old king james says earnestly covet the only thing you can covet in your life is the, the, the gifts of the spirit earnestly desire them seek after them say Lord use me they're not for sale there's not a price for them you can't buy them you can't go out and charge them on your card you have to be a candidate candidate to be used means you're pressing, pressing into the things of God. You're pressing into what God can use you for. It works in business. It works in church. It works in family. It, it works in retirement. It works in all kinds of things. Constantly. The Holy Spirit speaking to me on different, different things. And it's, a, it's a wonderful thing, but you can't, you, you can't like 
try to let it run you because he won't do that to you. But you'll try to, if you don't watch yourself, you'll, you'll want to operate in it all the time because it feels so good. But just make sure you're operating in it when the Holy Spirit brings it to you. And you'll know it. Amen? All right. So let's, let's uh, put your hand on the person next to you and just begin to pray for them, the person on your right and the person on your left. Thank you, Jesus. Well, as we close, I, I, I hope that you feel the presence of the Lord in this place. I feel like anytime you need His presence, anytime you need Him, He's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But as Paul said, you have to stir yourself up. Stir yourself up. Don't be afraid to stir up, shake up that can. Shake up the ingredients. Don't let them settle to the bottom in your life, okay? Don't let them settle down. Shake them up. And that's what I think I did tonight as a vessel. Everybody say a vessel. See, every single one of us are a vessel that God can pour through. And if he can get through you, he'll get it to you, okay? But if he can't get through you, then you'll be a stopgap. Don't be a stopgap. Be open, an open vessel that he pours into and then he pours out of. You hear what I'm saying? You see that? How one pours in, he pours into you so you can pour out on someone else. Amen? So we have to covet that. We have to desire that he would use us for that in a positive, correct, biblical way. Amen? All right. God bless you all. Hope you got something out of that. We'll see you next week. God bless you.